Hi everybody, this is Kamal. I'm co-founder of Accelerate AI. We are going to talk about very important aspect of data visualization, the concept and principles around it. It is a very important portion of the entire data science practice that we do as part of end-to-end -end process. We're going to talk about concepts and visualization and give a premise about it. So let's dive in. We're going to cover what is data visualization? Why is it important? What is the business context around it? What are the rules of visual perception? We will look into that. We are also going to talk about principles. There are various principles. We will focus on Edward Tufte's rules and how it is related to some of these principles and concepts that we use in our practice. And then we'll be talking about best practices, what we should do, what we should not do. And finally, summary of the key takeaways. So let's get deeper into this. First of all, what is data visualization, right? As when we look at the data, this is a representation in a tabular format. Now, this can be represented in many forms visually or in charts, be it line chart, bar chart, heat map, different type of star chart or pie chart, donor chart, so on. So essentially, we are representing the data which is in a tabular format to something which is more visual that we can conceive better. That, that's what is data visualization. When we look into the definition, and here it is from Wikipedia, it says data visualization is an interdisciplinary field that deals with graphical representation of data, right? Ideally, if we look at analysts and end users or business end users, they look at it as a graphical presentation of information with an objective to provide the viewer some qualitative understanding about it. They also mention about the graphical presentation, which may entail manipulation of different entities and attributes. And entities could be your points, lines, shapes, images, etc. Your attributes could be the color, size, position, and shape, and so on. So these are the representations of how the definition from, from Wikipedia and, of course, the definition from the analysts or business end users. Now let's try to look into the context of why this is important. What is the business context around the data visualization? If we look carefully, vision as an intuition, it stands out the primary and most powerful channel of input to our brain or to the human system. Almost 90% of it, the perception goes through that. It is also the most important way to connect to cognition. That is, we remember things better when we see them, right? And obviously, if you look at a visual, we can communicate through a visual portion much effectively than anything else. And we all know a picture can tell more than a thousand words, right? Now let's try to look into an example and then see why it is important. From a trends, patterns, exceptions perspective, yes, we, we understand that. But let's try to look into this tabular form of data where you have four set of informations with each X and Y, right? Now, can you spot the difference between these four sets and what about the outliers? How does that pattern represent? We have to really start thinking about it when we look at it. It's difficult to say just by looking at this tabular information. But when we go and quickly present it in a data visualization form or in charts, we can clearly see each of the set has got completely different patterns altogether. And this is what it is shown. The same data is represented here in charts. Now you can do your insights or thinking about whether there are differences. Yes, there are. And we can do it in two to three seconds, right? So, and of course, this is an example of Anscorp squatted, very famously known as, as an example. So the core is, Business and industry context, stakeholders are really important. 
And then that should be kept in mind who we are presenting to and what is the objective of it. Let's look at some of the other aspects also. So data visualization is also a graphical representation for analysis and communication that we know. And what such example is, we can identify patterns that are not obvious otherwise, because you know some things that we want to uncover from the data through the visualization. We can also do interactive charts, what if analysis, that also is another way to look at it dynamically. And of course, the ANSCOP is squatted, whatever we mentioned earlier uh, slide. Guiding the business user to relevant insight is the key as part of that. So essentially, one, the stakeholders and personas to keep in mind. Second, you should have a business goal or objective. Third, you are also trying to see what questions am I answering as part of this visualization? And then, of course, how interactive can I make to the end user or a guide that I can do so that it acts as a guidance to answering those questions? So these are the four important pillars of, of the data visualization aspect. And what we see from here is it's, it's, it's the what would you like to know needs to be followed up with what would you do if you knew this information? That's how we have to think about it. Let's get on to some of the rules of visual perception. If you look at this, you know, on the left hand side, uh, this person looks at it as a boat. And the other side, the other person looks at it, yeah, there's a land in the middle of the ocean or the water body, right? So it's the way we look at things, the relative perception that, that we carry is something which is very important. Now, when we start looking into what are the specific visual representation or the perception of the rules, one, we say the our brain does not process all that enters into the eye, right? It had filters some information. Then we are drawn to a similar pattern. You know, if we have seen something similar, then we treat it or perceive it accordingly. We see th another thing is we see things in relation to its surroundings. There is a there is a tight correlation between what's happening in the context of the surroundings, how it is. So how it helps all of these visual perception rules. If we look at how it helps us, the two key aspects. One is analyzing the data to find something. It could be a pattern. It could be something related to that. And then also kind of a storytelling, putting the story across to your end user or those who are consuming the data. And we will see some primary set of rules. There are uh, scientists, uh, one prominent one is Edward Tufte's. Then there is also Gestalt principle. Then you have price maximum, a maximum of uh, communication. There are various aspects. We will focus a lot on the Edward Tufte's rules. Some examples before we reach there. So essentially what we are saying is we see what we expect to see, right? So if you look at another example in, in this picture, can you find the second image? I'll pause for two, three seconds. What about now? Now you can, if you outline the dolphin in some different color, like green here, then you'll be able to see that, right? Then let's take another example. Now in this figure, which of the rectangles the lightest? Can we find out? I'll pause for two, three seconds again. And then so this, so ideally it's not. All of them are of same contrast. So essentially what we are seeing is, you know, we do not perceive absolutes. Instead we perceive differences, the relative differences that we perceive. This is very important aspect while considering the data visualization principles and concepts. Let's take the third example. Now, this is again towards a memory, how it plays a role in our cognition. This is the first image. One or two seconds, pause. This is another image. Now, did you find any difference? 
it's very difficult to tell, right? Now, if I compare both these first and second images side by side, then you'll be able to see very clearly there's an additional tree object that differentiates these two pictures. So what it means is memory plays a role in cognition. However, our working memory is limited and we must work towards that to boost our cognitive capability of the viewer who's looking at the visualization. Now let's jump on to Edward Tufte's rules and try to understand what are these concepts and how they relate to the data visualization. Before we get on to it, Edward Tufte, famous statistician, professor at Yale University. He also invented the concept of chart junk. We'll come back to that shortly. He also is a, you know, has, has written a book, The Visual Display of Quantitative Information, which was published in 83. And it's probably the most important book ever written on data visualization. So the some of the key principles, the first one is graphical integrity. What he's trying to intend there is, you know, the visual interpretation must tell truth. If you look at a particular image here, you have an image which is represented. That should not be the case. It's ideally should be avoided. And we'll talk about that in the subsequent slide. But to focus on the graphical integrity related aspect is how can we look at the life factor? How can we minimize it? We are talking about the life factor in this case. We'll, we'll go deeper into it shortly. Then something like a data ink ratio. We always have the objective to maximize the data ink ratio. So in these two cases of charts that is shown, the left-hand side is a strict no-no where you have to you have to have a practice of not using those type of charts, but the right-hand side, yes, you know, because we have high data per ink ratio. The third is about chart junk. What is a chart junk? You know, we have to avoid chart junk. And that's an example of it. On the left-hand side, we should avoid that. Same kind of data representation can be done very simple manner on the right-hand side, and that should be followed. There's also about fourth, which is data density, which is nothing but a string principle. We have to maximize the data density within reason so that, you know, when you expand or, or you know, kind of... Uh, further diminish the size, you should still hold the information adequately. Then you also have number five, small multiples. That's another principle. It's a great tool to visualize large dimensions, large quantities of data in, in a short uh, relative manner. Now let's quickly look into the graphical integrity and this example. So here, if you see, this is a classic example of fuel economy standards for autos. And the, the data which is represented is from 1978 to 1985. If you look at it, 1978, it is like, if we go by the figure on the chart, it's 0 0.6 inches long, whereas 1985 is 5.3 inches long. So essentially, the weight is represented on the graph. It's kind of a seven to eight times increase. If you look at it, it's almost 783% increase. But actually, if we look at the data, it's not like that. It's just 18 to 27.5. So it's kind of a 1.5x increase or 53% increase precise. So the life factor, what Edward Tofte has defined is the size of the effect zone in the graphic divided by size of effect in data. And that should be as minimum as possible. That should be ideal is this one. That should be the same, because if the data tells that in 1978, it is 18 miles per gallon, and then in 1985, it is 27.5 miles per gallon. So it's kind of increased to 50 to 50 point percent. So your graph also should be proportionate to that, and it should not show something exaggerately or also diminish in that matter. So here, if you look at the life factor, it's 783 by 53, that's 14.8, which is 15, which is extremely high. And that's why this should be avoided. So this is a very, very important aspect. We do this in many of our examples, many of our uh, uses in our data visualization related use cases, we should minimize the life factor. Second very 
funny aspect is about using consistent scales within the graphical integrity. So here, if you take the example of uh, the number of adult frogs in the South Pond, you know, by from May to June, July, and then all the way to September, on the top you have the the size which is which is not that consistent scale. But on the bottom, that's the ideal way, and we should be representing that way. If it is three x, then you represent with a consistent scale so that it is more appropriate to the end user who is viewing this, right? So comparison and content aspect has to be looked into. So use consistent scales while showing these kind of charts. Another one is about on the graphical integrity is about presenting the data in context. So if you look at uh, on, on the, this is an example of on the top and bottom, you would see on the right hand side, the Connecticut traffic deaths from 1951 to 1959. It's represented, but on the top you would see it's just about one city. Yes, there is a trend, but it's about one city. So we don't really make much about it. So the, the graphics has to have some data in context. When you look to the bottom of the picture, similar data representation, but it is kind of compared with other cities, which means how the data is for New York, for Massachusetts, for Connecticut, for Rhode Island. Now, if you look at all the four, then you will have a very practical understanding of how these are related, which one is going up, down, which has increased, what is the trend and so on. So there are also, there always be a correlation and then putting the data in context is very, very important. And that's what he was trying to emphasize as part of this. Data ink ratio, we were talking about this one of the points. So obviously you would see on this left hand side of the chart, the height data per ink ratio is very, very important. Another example on the right hand side, these two, which is mentioned, you know, if you have a regression line, something like this, that, or whatever you are trying to demonstrate, that is relevant. And then, you know, too much of data ink uh, in, in this case is important, not the non-data ink or the low data ink part. So that's where we say data ink ratio is the data ink divided by total ink used to print the graphic. So on this examples on the top two examples that is shown, if you see wherever it is a lot of ink used to print the graphic is strict no-no. You know, whatever is the data ink specific aspect that has to be represented on the on the canvas or on the on the chart. Then the next one is about chart junk. That these are some of the examples of chart junk. We should avoid it unnecessarily. We should not complicate the, the visual effect in a manner to beautify it. It's not needed at all. And this is a very important aspect of uh, the, the entire data visualization that Professor Tufte has uh, defined. And he has mentioned that, you know, you have to avoid the chart junk as much as possible, wherever it is possible. It's definitely a no-no. We also look at um, Professor Gestalt's principle of um, perception. It's, it's a group of researchers in early 20th century known as the Gestalt psychologists. They have formulated these four uh, key concepts. One is proximity, one is continuity, third is similarity, and fourth is closer. Mm -hmm. If you look at this, this is about how we look at the perception, the visual perception of things. On the proximity side of it, if you see, there are two examples. The same, uh, you know, dots on the left hand side are close together, whereas if they are slightly apart based on their proximity, we perceive them as two different groups, right? So if you have to really look at it and think from the proximity angle, are you keeping something together so that the end user will view it as, oh, these are part of one group. If they are not really, then it's a problem. So that part has to be looked into it. Second, when you look at continuity, this has an example, obviously the colors, the different type of representations, shapes will pose something. So we have to see how the continuity and then accordingly, wherever appropriate has to represent our visualization on, on the on the paper. Third is about similarity. As a human brain, we always look into similar type of things, similar colors, similar shapes to be all as, as one part or you know in, in one group. So that's what we visualize. So 
our representation also should to align to that. And then fourth one is closure. Something if you see, you know, is hidden at the same time, our eye perceives it as a structure or a representation of a graphical item. You know, on the right hand side, if you see it's not a football or a circular object, but we would see it as a football because our, our eye is trained to see those kind of figures as a uh, as a football, right? So th these are all some of the perceptions of our principles that he has mentioned that we should keep in mind while keeping our data visualization because that way it would be much more relevant to the end user who is consuming the data. So let's get on to some of the best practices. Um, if Before we move on to some of the examples, just wanted to quickly have a um, chart on some of the examples and the chart types that should be used. This is a, uh, of course, a non-exhaustive uh, list, but you can look at the comparison distribution. These are different scenarios. If you are comparing the data, what type of chart types you should use. If you're distributing the data, if you're, if you're looking for composition, part to whole compos composition, those kind of things, what type of chart chart or data to be should be used or what what should we use in terms of relationships trends uh, performance related data or hierarchy and so on right now let's take an example of one of the two one is comparison when we are here in this case we are looking at a profit in us dollars by city by year and there are three years if you look at 2004 2005 2006 a sample data represented and we have four cities, Florida, Texas, Arizona, and California. And then if you look at the data uh, for three different years, it's actually compared in a very simple manner, outlining some of their values. Of course, you, if, if there is no need to mention the grid line, you can avoid it. You can keep it for your um, reflection of how, how things are going and what is the data. If you're already having the uh, shapes or the values in, in the level, of each and every unit, you may not uh, mention that as well. But when you are comparing this, you're comparing with three different years, 2004, 2005, 2006, and a same kind of representation across four specific cities, right? So this is a bar chart example where you are comparing. Composition where we typically use, you know, pie chart is a good example. You can use donut and others as well, where relatively, you know, some specific set of uh, information and then part to whole kind of a relationship when that happens in a composition. And all of these should sum it up to ideally 100% because that's what a pie chart that we try to represent. That's an example. Let's look into some of the best practices quickly. And, and these are again, non exhaustive list only. The first one is if you look at this as an example, on the left-hand side, it's an ideal chart because it starts from zero. Always we have to start our Y-axis or X-axis related data from zero to avoid any misinformation or misrepresentation of the data, right? Second one is starting from 0.62, that is not correct. Then the second best practice, we are talking here about on the left-hand side, if you have more than five or six categories, ideally we should not use a pie chart, right? Pie chart is there where you have a clean, information of some five to six categories and they should sum it up to you know 100 ideally to be able to represent that thing on the right hand side if you look at there are too many categories to represent and it's it's very distorted that should be avoided third best practice on the left hand side you'll see the conjunction of units by year where from 2006 to 2012 we have represented the conjunction units values for a particular uh, city right on the right hand side, we should improve the readability by eliminating unnecessary or unwanted excess values, legends or grid lines, which are not even needed in this case. So second one is simple and we should focus that way. Base practice four, investment by area of impact in thousand US dollars is what represented here. Now here also, if you look at it, we have used horizontal bar as a chart to improve the readability from ascending or descending whatever we can look at it ideally ascending looks better but when dealing with multiple categories with long names on the right hand side you'll see community improvement youth development a lot of these things are, are relatively larger names it is always better to keep it horizontal and make it a better readability from that perspective 
Another best practice is as much as possible, we need to stick to few colors and it should use contrast to highlight some of the important information. If it is more than five or six and we are having different colors, it's very difficult for the end user to really identify and visualize and make out what's happening, right? In this case, if you want to just highlight something which is the highest or the growth is more towards the last instance in, in this kind of a sample data representation, then the left-hand side is better. We are highlighting that in, in a span of six or seven uh, items rather than you know just using a lot of colors on the right-hand side, which is no-no. Another best practice is about small multiples. We have seen this as one of the principles from Edward Tufte. Uh, it's, it's a great tool to visualize large uh, dimensions or quantities of data with high number of uh, dimensions as we have seen here. So spark lines are data intense, design simple, and word-sized graphics. This would quickly represent a lot of information in a proper manner, and we should use it. So this is, uh, this is the summary of chart suggestions to look at. Um, this is again source and credit from Dr. Ap uh, Apela. Uh, he has put together this, um, uh, you know, the compel based on what is the need. If you look at, if your need is comparison, then you should look at on on the top of these things what what varieties that we can look at. If if the need is distribution, then we go whether distribution by single variable or two variables or more than two variables and so on. Then if it is composition, then are we talking about some static data or which is changing over time? Accordingly, there are different charts suggested for that. And if there are relationships that we have to show, two, real, two variables relationships, scatter plots, more than that, three variables, bubble plot, and so on. So those type of things that, that we can look at. So this is a quick summary of something that is represented pretty well. Now coming on to Business intelligence tools and programming languages. If you look at business intelligence tools, we use Excel, Power BI, Click, Tableau, Sysons, a lot of these software to be able to represent some of the data visualizations, dashboard creations, and things like that. You also can do it from some of the programming languages like Python and R, and they have different libraries, packages for it. Now, putting visualizations together to create dashboards. Uh, there are some examples that we have put together here with the source of uh, Microsoft Power BI community. When you look at these as a, as a dashboard, if you have considered some of the principles that we have been talking about and refer them, then how effectively we can prepare or create a dashboard in this segment. So this is an example of customer segmentation details. It's an illustr illustrative data set. And as you would see, some of the summary you know, like total sales, total profits and all that we want to put on top. And then of course, some of the important charts that is relevant for, for that objective. If the reason why is average sales by month, that particular trend we want to show, which is important for the end user, then that comes next. And then of course, the kind of a heat map to show the product wise sales analysis. And then if you have a tabular representation and all that you should look at on the bottom of the entire dashboard, to be able to represent it as well. So this is kind of a sample uh, representation of dashboard and how we can put some of our visualization thoughts, principles, concepts into it to create a robust dashboard. Another example is about a sales dashboard here. You could see you know, some of the interactive options given to the end user, like selecting a KPI, if whether I want to see by revenues or profits on the top, and then also we have to select the product and channel based on which this may change. So kind of a, we are giving a dynamic interactive guidance to the end user to be able to use in, in that frame of uh, canvas. Another third example of uh, a similar dashboard, this is about attendance tracker and it talks about various information uh, similarly with regards to the um, absence reduction report kind of thing. So net net, if we look at some of the effective dashboard design principles, one very important aspect is we have to consider our audience, what the audience wants, you know, and then we have to ask questions to see, are we answering those questions while creating the visualization, while creating the dashboard for them? Because essentially we are preparing it for them. So we can ask some of the, this is a sample checklist of questions like, ask how a dashboard will be used, how the end user is going to use it. 
what information does the user need to be successful what are key important kpis or key performance indicator that needs to be there what are the important metrics that needs to be captured and so on how much of detail does the user need you know if if user does not need a lot of information we don't need to go to that much detail we just need to restrict ourselves to some specific areas to be very precise and specific and crisp to that and so on so you have some of these as an example you can use it as a checklist and the first point is about considering your audience second is about using some of the best practices we have seen from edward tufte's principles and some of the other visualization points what is relevant what is not relevant and so on see one of the things that we have seen is you know obviously a good design would tell a better and powerful story right so avoid too much information or noise or clutter that is not needed for the end user that is not needed for as far as the business objective is concerned limit the content to fit entirely on one screen because ideally that's the premise of what what audience or the stakeholders is going to look at it and then of course you have to start with a high level of detail on the upper corner of the screen and then so more detail as you move down in the direction the audience is used to read because obviously everybody wants to go from top and then go towards you know reading towards the bottom and keep your dashboard simple with probably 3 to 5 key values charts or tables do not clutter too many information unless and until what is needed and based on that priority that can be set and of course a lot of other um checklist points can be looked into same way then the third is about avoiding some common mistakes or issues we should know what are the do's and don'ts about it and these are some examples that that can be used as checklist item so you know i'm not going through all of these uh, you can you can read through it and then get an idea of what is relevant and what is not okay so then let's kind of sum it up with key takeaways as part of this entire session that we have been talking about three key aspects right first is you know the stakeholders keep the business stakeholders in mind aim to provide answers to the business goal or objective that you have that that's one key area second key area that we have seen is about focusing on the business and industry context what is the right chart for the right purpose we have also seen if you are doing composition if you are doing the relationship between various things you know what type of charts to pick how to pick where to apply and of course there are a whole lot of the color the proposition the the positioning of it and all that we have to look at it and then third we also have to look at how to keep it simple interactive guided as per the end user so that it's dynamic interactive intuitive for them to use it it has to be as simple as possible yet powerful and solve the purpose right and then of course continuously follow the data visualization principles edward tufte's principles and others that we have been talking about that's about it hope you have liked this video please give your comments feedback on the descriptions on the comments below on this video we'll try to focus on some of the important aspects uh, as we go along uh, but hope you have liked this thank you so much and have a good day